makes us a place with the helpful hardware folks. We have three kids, and somehow their hands and feet are always on the walls. So I went to the paint studio at Ace. I told Donna when it comes to durable paint, you can't do better than Valspar Optimus. Ace is the place that knows a lot about paint. But not why kids drag their hands on walls when they walk. Now through the 4th, buy a gallon of Valspar Optimus and get one free. That's up to $47 in saving. Limit one free gallon per household, which must be of equal or lesser value. Prices may vary. While supplies last, store stock only. See participating stores for details. Blog Talk Radio. Hi, and welcome to Conscious Talk Radio. And I'm your host, Linda Summers. And these shows are about relationships and all that that encompasses. And the guest experts on the show will be providing you with information as to how you can become more connected with yourself. And today's topic is the role of conscious relationship in our planetary family's conscious evolution with Brian Leslie Miller. And before we bring Brian on board, I'd like to give you some background information on him. Brian was born in western Massachusetts, is a lover of nature, and had a profound realization at the age of 12 in the forest, which led to becoming a seeker of truth. After moving to California 20-plus years of study and practice and acquiring a master's in spiritual psychology from the famed University of Santa Monica, Brian underwent a breakthrough experience where he experientially awakened from the illusion of separation. And with that, I'd love to welcome Brian to the show. Hi, Brian. Hi, Linda. Good to be here. Glad to Uh, share. Yes, yes. And such great timing, and we're really, really glad to have you here and um, because we're really in a time of really evolving, and I, you know, that would be great to really talk about this conversation of the role of conscious relationship in our planetary family's conscious evolution and really what that means. But before I wanted to go into that, I really, I feel like the listeners, you know, that you had this experience about awakening from the illusion of separation. Can you elaborate on that just a little bit of how you really came, you know, like what that looks like? Uh, yeah, definitely. I, I, I will answer that in a second. And I just wanted to speak into something that I heard you say, and that was like the time that we find ourselves in, the time that like right now that we're, that the reason that we're actually on this call together mm-hmm. is that humanity is in the process of waking up. We are in a crisis and what's known about crisis is that it also points to opportunity that anytime there's a breakdown of something, there's an opportunity to build something new that's a better version. And it really feels like that's what we're in right now, you know, with the the whole the millennial thing and then the 2012, the, the end of the world, it was the end of the world as we know it. And we're definitely in the throes of, of change right now. So it's very exciting. So to answer your question about the separation, the – Illusion, delusion of separation. See if my memory serves me, if I can capture Einstein's quote where he says um, that really like our task, if we're up for it, is to awaken from the optical delusion of consciousness that has us believing that we are separate from nature and all of its beauty. And that our our task, if we're up for it, is to widen our circle of compassion, to include everything. And that's because this is the guy that gave us E equals MC squared. Everything on one side of the equation is equal to the E, which means energy. (laughs) So if you, you know, you just look at that equation, everything is one thing. But But to talk more into the experience that most people are having, including myself before I had this awakening experience, Mm -hmm. is that I really felt that there was a me and there was a life, that there was two things happening. And as a human being, my job was to figure out how do I survive life? It's almost like the the instruction manual before awakening is Mm -hmm. use your skills and abilities, best of your ability, to make it through life and have some enjoyment. Which is not an easy task. Say again? Which is not an easy task. Which which is not an easy task when you consider the the egos, the part that's responsible for giving us the experience of being an individual Mm -hmm. is called the ego. Mm -hmm. And there's there's uh, there's the necessary ego, 
so that we can have this divine experience of being human, but there's also the false ego, which is basically full of crap. It's a big liar. <laughs> and what it, what it basically does is it, it, um, it generates problems. It finds fault. It, it fi- it's, it's, you know, you can just look at your own thinking and see that the, the almost natural MO of that chatterbox in our head is to mm-hmm. find fault, to look at what's not working. Right. Right. And that actually comes, it comes from the conditioning of our our caveman mind, our caveman brain, which its sole purpose, our limbic brain, its sole purpose is to make sure that we survive. So it's it's hyper vigilantly on the lookout for things that can do harm, which is essentially an equivalent in our in our modern day life. There are no saber tooth tigers or woolly mammoths trying to run us down. So what that capacity does is instead of looking for saber-toothed tigers, it's looking for what's wrong. Mm -hmm. And what's possible is to essentially transcend operating from that level of our awareness. Um, But I I do want to come back just because I I, I get on tangents. Sorry, folks. Hopefully there will all be good tangents. But... uh, to go back to the question about my experience of awakening, um, what happened was I came upon a teaching from India, and for three months, that was all I did, day and night, was apply this teaching, which is to remove the four layers that the mind puts over absolute truth and unity, which is bliss. Mm-hmm. And uh, I maybe I can go into that in another talk, but just to, to use this time well, I'll say that uh, the, the the first layer that we can see is that when I wake up in the morning and I open my eyes, my mind instantaneously labels everything in my visual field. You can doesn't even have to be first thing; you can do it right now. Close your eyes, open your eyes. And you see, boom, in a, in a fraction of a second, your mind has oriented you to time and space and has labeled everything in your visual field. So that's creating separation out of, out of the oneness. Because when you close your eyes, the only experience that you're having is sensation. You might feel the sensation of the breeze on your skin. You might have the sensation of... Mm thoughts but there's there's no there's no multitude of things right there's just the you the awareness that's having the sensations mm-hmm. so what the teaching says is stop the mind from labeling everything and what will be revealed is what is underneath the truth of reality underneath all of those labels and so it took 3 months but it happened, and I woke up one morning, and when I looked at my feet, it was the strangest thing. I knew, <laughs> it's even funny to say it, but I knew that they weren't my feet. I knew that I I am the thing that is in this body. Mm. I'm borrowing this body. Right. Right? Yep. That's pretty profound. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. <laughs> I'm borrowing this body so I can have experiences and what my experiences, every single one of them is love, serve, remember. Every single one of my life falls into one of those categories. Learn how to love myself or another. Mm -hmm. To remember the value of service and how good it feels. That's like the, the... the pinnacle of human experience is to give without needing or wanting anything back. Right, right. So love, serve, and then remember. The, mm-hmm. the, the remainder of our lessons are all pointers to remembering the truth that we are a being. We're human. They call us human being, but we're a human being. And... 
that kind of brings me to where I was kind of thinking to dive in is since the talk is really about, you know, conscious relationship, it kind mm-hmm. of begs it begs the question, well, what's unconscious relationship? Yeah. And, or, you know, mm-hmm. if we're going to define conscious relationship, let's start with kind of defining some of the unconscious things that happen in relationship. And how does that happen in the first place? How does it, how do we get, A, how do we get to conscious relationship? And how did we end up in unconscious relationship? And in asking that question, where I arrive at is the context. It's really about what do I think life is? Where do I think I am right now? What do I think I am doing in this thing called life, right? What's my context? Where do I, where do I think I find and so if I, if I see myself as a limited, separate human, physical being, physical, physical entity, let's say, in a physical world, then I'm, essentially I'm operating, my context is a, a physical world. It's limited to only a physical world, right? Right. Mm-hmm. But then the, the other context is I'm a human being, so let's focus more on the being part. Every every religion, every belief system in the world talks about a soul, you know, whether they talk about going on to an afterlife or what we're doing here. It kind of speaks into the, the mystery of life. No one, you know, no one here knows how, how exactly we get here, how it is that we are here. Right. And so the, the, there's a deep underlying mystery. You know, you talk to anyone, everyone, the best, the best person, they can really just overlay something onto this big fat question mark. And where I live from is that the mystery is actually the thing that allows children to be in wonder when they first arrive here. Mm-hmm. They're filled with wonder. Oh my gosh, this is such an amazing place. Holy cow, it's wonderful. Oh, look at that. <laughs> They're excited about everything. And now when we combine that sense of wonder with a more adult ability to wrap our head around where we actually are, it becomes sacred. That sense of wonder actually can can kind of morph into a sense of sacred. Mm Mm-hmm. Because of the set, because I wake up in the morning, I'm like, oh, I'm alive again. I get a whole other day. <laughs> wow, I had nothing to do with that. It's just a gift. <laughs> Truly, when you think about that, I mean, you know, you wonder when you go to sleep that, okay, the breathing, you know, and then so really what does wake you up? What brings you out of that, out of that sleep, you know? I mean, these are all questions yeah. like, wow, it's pretty amazing. Mm-hmm. So, <clears throat> I wish we had five hours because there's just I so know. much. A lifetime, Brian. Yeah. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> on this uh, topic, but uh, to to bring it home and really make sure that I add value, um, I want to talk into some of the unconscious behaviors um, yeah. that I've seen that I I, I have. Not only have I experienced them, I have demonstrated them to others. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I've been the perfect as well as the uh, victim. <laughs> uh-huh. Right? Oh, yeah. But, yeah. Uh, it, and you know, it really is a journey. We have to we have to be gentle with ourselves and loving with ourselves, compassionate with ourselves, because we, it is a journey. Um, I encourage people to look up uh, Google Spiral Dynamics because that really is a wonderful model of the evolution of consciousness. Um, Yeah, so unconscious relating, what does that look like? I have no relationship with myself. I am, I don't, I do not self-reflect. I am not self-aware. And I do not have any self-nurturing practices. The only place that I get love is by, by manipulating it from others. Or you know, um, giving to get, let's say. Yeah. Right. 
There's, so all mm-hmm. my all the loving only comes from outside. Right. That would be that would be unconscious to me. Um, I can so much I can say here, but self reflection. You know, know thyself. Socrates, Plato, a couple of smart guys. <laughs> know thyself. Pretty much yeah. boiled the whole thing down to know thyself. Right. Recognize what you are, and then go in and look at what are my belief systems, and how mm-hmm. is that affecting my experience of reality. Um, the self-nurturing piece is also enormous because so many of us did not get a high-functioning model of self-nurturing. Um, the generations before us were taught that you're, the the mother comes last, like mom takes care of everybody, and then mm-hmm. if there's anything left or any time left or any energy left, she gives to herself. A right. very poor model of self-nurturing. Yes, yeah, very. Mm-hmm. That's true. So, been very true. So, so that's like a really good place to start coming into relationship with ourselves and loving ourselves. Another, another real uh, awesome hack is from Jack Canfield, and he says, "Look in the mirror, look in your own eyes, and say, mm-hmm. I love you." Mm-hmm. Start with mm-hmm. "I like you," but if you say, like, guaranteed, when you say "I love you," looking in your own eyes the first time. It doesn't go right in. There's resistance there, which is quite telling. Mm-hmm. Um, the other unconscious behavior that seems like I, you know, in doing the relationship counseling I've been doing for a while here, I see a lot of blaming. Yeah, yeah. And you know, I had a housemate that said, "Isn't it funny? Blame is actually be lame." Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and so really what it is, is it's a lack of personal responsibility. Mm-hmm. The other person is doing whatever they're doing, and it might be upsetting. But the moment I go to blame them, I'm not, you know, uh, well, how do I want to say this? Well, blaming is a perfect place for me to kind of segue into owning projection. It's the biggest tool I could possibly mention or emphasize in in turning an unconscious relationship into a conscious relationship. Mm -hmm. And if you can imagine yourself pointing a finger at somebody, notice, you know, like you're like making a gun out of your hand or whatever, you know, pointing a finger. There's three fingers pointing back at us. And not, I'm, I'm surprised at how many people haven't seen this demonstration or come to this information, but it is enormously helpful to see that the only way that I can point out something in someone else is if I knew of it myself. Yeah. Otherwise, I wouldn't have a label for it. Mm. And wow. how it is that I know of it is that I do that behavior but I'm not aware that I do that behavior. I'm not aware to the degree that I do that behavior. So what I'm doing is I'm projecting it onto this other person who's acting as a mirror for me to be able to see what I can't see about myself. I'm projecting it outside because I don't see it inside. I'm projecting it outside so that I can now see it right in front of my eyes. And if I have the skill... I take ownership of that projection, and the charge never has to enter into the relating with that person. Let's say it's my significant other. Right. You know, and she, I've, I'm having an experience where I feel like she's not listening. I can point the finger at her and say, hey, you're not listening. But before I actually open my mouth and say anything, let me stop and go wait three fingers pointing back at me, where am I not listening? Right, right. Oh, look at that. Okay, I see. I'm not listening to myself. I'm not listening to my heart. I'm not listening to spirit, whatever. I'm not listening to intuition. And then the moment that I've seen that this other person has actually served me by pointing out not listening, (laughs) now 
when I when I bring it to him, there's no charge. When I bring it to my my there's there's no charge. I can say, wow, I I noticed that I was upset by feeling like you weren't listening, and I just I just want to apologize for the times that I don't listen. And I still do feel that way, but I wonder if you would like to talk about it or open to talk about it instead of you're not listening, you never listen. <laughs> <laughs> right, and so much of that happens in relationships, all relationships, kids, lovers, partners, you know, it's a constant. Yeah, and it's because of the, it's it's going kind of going back to the lack of self-reflection, because when mm-hmm. I become self-reflective, then I become aware of my default patterns. I become aware mm-hmm. of the places that trigger me. Mm-hmm. And then... I can move from being in reactive relationship to actually starting to use the tool of owning projection, and then I actually get to choose my response. And mm-hmm. what you know, uh, my guess is if you're listening to this program, that you're on some kind of a path of becoming more conscious. And conscious people, when they have a choice of where they're going to relate from, it's mm-hmm. love. And I love what you said about response versus reaction. So I think that's a really good um, way of also um, being aware and recognizing, wow, if I'm reacting, that's something within me, right? As opposed to responding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um. The the thing about responding actually caused me to remember one of the other things that I had thought about in unconscious uh, relating, having experienced it, um, is listening from the place of waiting to respond. Mm. <laughs> it's like I'm not actually, I'm not going to, let's say I'm the person that's talking and the other person is, is doing the listening. And the moment I stop, they chime in. Like they're almost, it's almost like they're, I can feel them like waiting to interrupt what I'm Mm -hmm. saying so that they can say what they want to say. Mm -hmm. What are the chances that I'm going to feel deeply heard or that I'm going to feel so heard that I actually feel seen? Mm -hmm. Right? Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in conscious re- in conscious relating, one of the things is actually to listen for the other person, to actually, to, I call it healing listening. Because I am so present, hanging on every single word that this person is telling me because I want to feel what they're feeling. I want them to, I want them to, have the experience of getting of being gotten it is the most healing thing so many people do not have that in their life someplace where they feel like completely seen and got understood and it is a basic human need mm-hmm. absolutely So let's see, what's another thing I, I wanted to say? Oh, yeah, so the big, kind of the big thing for me about conscious relating and why I, I choose this path is that life is the school, love is the lesson. Mm. And if you've, ever, if you've ever taken stock of your life, you will notice that lessons have the ability to repeat. If you don't get it the first time, it's coming around another time. Mm. If you don't get it that time, it's coming around again. <laughs> and if you don't get it that time, it's coming around again. And when it comes around that time, the consequence is going to be greater. Because when you, let's say the lesson is don't touch the red hot stove to see if it's hot. Mm-hmm. The, moment you, the moment you integrate that lesson, that type of pain will no longer need to be in your life. So your quality of life improves. So when life brings your lessons around a second and third time and the consequence increases, it's actually life itself loving you into a higher state. 
conscious relationship says, okay, I see, I recognize that the place in life where most people seem triggered, the most triggered, is in their intimate relationships. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah. Okay. So, so maybe intimate relationship is a crucible for personal growth. Mm-hmm. It's a crucible for self-awareness. Mm-hmm. Hence, conscious relating. I'm no longer just going on my default patterns that were picked up based on what I saw growing up. I'm actually stopping and saying, does that behavior serve me? What do I believe about that? What do I feel is the right way to be in this situation? You know, so I'm actually, it's really like looking under every rock and leaf uh, at our beliefs and, and determining, does this serve me? Is this getting me where I'm going, which is living with an open heart, um, able to freely give and receive love and, mm-hmm. and loving myself first and foremost. Absolutely. So it's, it's like a learning orientation to life. which you can actually look that up on YouTube. I did a talk, Learning Orientation to Life. Oh, cool. Yeah. I have to do that. Everybody's listening also to um, to do that as well. I mean, that sounds so... Can you elaborate on that just a bit, like learning um, orientation to life and what the benefits of that would be? Thank you. Good question. Um so I, I I had a very rough childhood, and I I told myself a lot of uh, illogical, untrue stories growing up. <laughs> I'm not lovable. I'm not good enough. I am fundamentally flawed. My own mother doesn't love me. All these you know stories. Blah blah blah. My parents got divorced when I was seven. Um, and what that. Um, A learning orientation to life says use everything for your growth, upliftment, and learning. Mm -hmm. And it says says that um, really, I mean, we are here to love, serve, and remember. Mm -hmm. And it is very true. It is very true that if let's say I only, uh, I'm trying to think how to illustrate this, but if I only love myself halfway, how could I possibly love someone else completely? Yeah, you can. Mm-hmm. Like, if I only love these parts, this part and this part and that and part and that part of myself, mm-hmm. when those other parts that I don't love <laughs> show up in someone else, yeah. how am I able to love? Them? Now, I can't love it over there. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't love it here. Um, But the other thing is that when I adopt the learning orientation to life, never again, because everything is for my growth, upliftment, and learning, never again can I be a victim because the positive things that happen are showing me, hey, keep doing that. That's good. That that leads to happiness. Keep your your in alignment with the divine Mm. flow. Right? Mm, Yeah. Right. Now, if I'm not taking a learning orientation to life, I can easily feel like a victim to life. Oh, this is happening to me. Like when life return brings a lesson around the third time and it really, really stings. Yes. I can feel like it's being mean to me. I can feel like a victim. This is happening to me. Life isn't fair. You know? right. No, it, it's very, very fair. In fact, it's loving. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, the learning orientation to life uh, allows me to essentially always be in a learning, a learning mode. Yes. And what that means is I'm going to up level. I'm going to I'm going to be happier more often because there's going to be fewer and fewer things that will be able to throw me off center. Mhm. Um. Well, and I loved how you said, too, about looking at every move we make, like everything that we're constantly doing to take a look at our intention or what it is that just really being present with that decision that we're making. I love that. Yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, what, and the, what, one, go ahead. Okay. No, you. Go ahead. Well, I was going to ask you, what is one 
thing, I know there's so many, it's really a hard question to really ask or answer because I'm sure there's a multiple things, but what's one thing that you can give our listeners like a gem that you have really learned on this journey so far? I got, I got it. I got to keep it to two things. I can't do it just one. <laughs> I don't stop. Um, stop. Num- the number one thing it, we've heard it all of our lives: self love. Yeah. It is absolutely the most transformational thing that you could possibly do as a human being. Watch the video. Go on YouTube. Watch the video. A learning orientation to life. How I conclude that talk is I talk about why self-love is the pinnacle of human experience. But my experience of self-love was that it unlocked every part of my being. The day that I hit self-love, uh, I, it, it, I, I am a man of words, and I, it's, it's difficult to put into words the freedom and elation and the sense of knowing and the sense of wholeness and completion and yeah there's nothing there's nothing more important to strive for yeah that's really cool and then the second nugget is mindfulness mm. now in in terms of love serve remember I feel like mindfulness is the part that really aids us in remembering. And the more I practice mindfulness, which mindfulness, which is to become of where I'm what I am doing as I am doing it. Become of what I am thinking as I am thinking it. Right? Mm-hmm. So I'm present, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. And what that does is it takes us more and more and more out of the monkey mind. Yes. The conditioned ego mind. Mm-hmm. And the more I become present, the more I'm at choice, the more peace I'm going to have, the more love that's actually already going to be flowing through my system. Mm-hmm. And then I have the ability to, A, meet my own needs mm-hmm. um, and mm-hmm. ask for my needs to be met because I'll be aware of what they are. Right. Um, but also to to know what would feel loving towards myself. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. When you love yourself, you know that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, oh, you know, as I, I heard myself say it, i got to plug one more thing, and that is really, mm-hmm. really getting clear about my own needs. Um, look up Marshall Rosenberg from Nonviolent Communication, He has a listing of basic human needs. And if I don't know what my needs are, I'm going to go through life kind of flailing, trying to meet my need. Well, maybe this will do it. Maybe that will do it. Maybe this will do it. Maybe that will do it. Maybe this will do it. But I don't even know what need I'm trying to meet. I'm just feeling need. So very unconsciously going, oh, maybe this, maybe that, maybe this, maybe that. Mm -hmm. But the more I become aware of my needs... I can either meet them myself or consciously ask someone, hey, I have this need. Would you be willing to help me meet it? And then being willing, you know, being willing and able to hear no. Mm -hmm. I love that. Gosh, what great gems. Absolutely. And you also mentioned relationship counting, too. So people can get a hold of you by going to your website, realtransformation.com. They can go to realtransformation.com. They mm-hmm. can look up uh-huh. Real Transformation Consulting. Uh, I'm sorry, Real Transformation Counseling on, on Yelp. And, yeah, brian at realtransformation.com is my email. Perfect. And I, I, love, I love to give people like a 20, 30-minute uh, complimentary call just so they can get a feel for what, you know, how my intuition can help accelerate their growth um, Mm -hmm. and also see what nuggets I can and offer, you know, I love to give, um, you know, they Mm -hmm. say selfless, selfless giving is a pinnacle. Mm -hmm. So true. Awesome. Well, is there any specials that you have going on, any workshops or anything like that that you can um, let the listeners know as well? 
There's a workshop coming up. I don't have the date confirmed yet, but if you uh, if you go to my website and look up services, okay. all, all listings will be there. And okay. if you contact me and you uh, and you mention that you heard me on on the Conscious Talk Radio, we'll do a uh, twenty dollar discount. Awesome! Perfect. All right, that yeah. sounds wonderful. Well, Brian, thank you, thank you, thank you so much for being on the show today and really bringing in um, about relationships and how important it is in the whole, uh, the bigger perspective of really of the world, but it begins with ourselves. So just phenomenal. I mean, I'm just in awe of, uh, of where, you know, where you're at and, um, and just really bringing this to people. It's really important and I really appreciate that. So thank you so much. Thank you, Linda. It's been a pleasure, and I I look forward to being on again and sharing some more insights. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because, you know, like I said when we first started talking that where we're headed and where we're at right now, it's so important for people to wake up. And I I feel that you have a lot of uh, really gems to really be able to bring awareness to people, you know, to have them start, excuse me, to think and so to to, uh, start their own awakening. So. Awesome. So yeah. we thank you again. Yeah, thank all the listeners out there who joined us today and the ones who be joining us via YouTube. We thank you so much. Please don't forget to follow, subscribe, comment, and like us. And you can join me next week, July 7th, gosh, 30 July, for the next show, The Importance of Being in Right Relationship with Self, Others, and Source with Ava Fernandez. So we're going to be talking about, you know, self-love and really how important this really is. So Awesome. So thank you again, Brian. We really appreciate having you on the show. Yes, be well and be good to yourself. Be great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Bye. Ace is a place with the helpful hardware folks. We have three kids, and somehow their hands and feet are always on the walls. So I went to the paint studio at Ace. I told Donna when it comes to durable paint, you can't do better than Valspar Optimus. Ace is the place that knows a lot about paint. But not why kids drag their hands on walls when they walk. Now through the 4th, buy a gallon of Valspar Optimus and get one free. That's up to $47 in saving. Limit one free gallon per household, which must be of equal or lesser value. Prices may vary. While supplies last, store stock only. See participating stores for details. Celebrate America's birthday in style with a little help from your friendly neighborhood Vons. Get great deals on 4th of July favorites for a festive gathering with friends and family. For a delicious backyard cookout, shop with your club card and get boneless, skinless chicken breast or thighs for just $1.59 a pound when you buy three pounds or more. And pick up large personal watermelons for only $1.88 each. Tastier meats, sweeter produce, better celebrations. Vons. Fact is, it's just better.